on such a beautiful day in the house of the Lord. Amen. Thank you for that, Basil. And it was great to hear that angel singing here this morning, wasn't it, eh? Jennifer, thank you very much. We're very honoured to have you here with us this morning. And um, as Diane was relating that story about when she was practising at home as a, as a child and everyone covered their ears, I had something similar happen to me just two weeks ago. I was in the garage getting ready to go and feed my little calf and I'm singing away and praising the Lord in the garage and the neighbour brought us down some, um, some milk and Mary Ann answers the door in her pyjamas because she'd been sick and you know what he said? He said to Mary Ann, I can understand why you're sick after hearing that noise in the garage so there may be a chance for me yet. Just uh, a little bit of business that we just want to tie up this morning before we go into the sermon. Last week you all received a copy of the nominating committee's um, uh, piece of paper for the new offices for the church and that's been um, in your hands for the whole week and it's been available for you to comment on and we've had no comments back which is good and we thank God for that. So I'd like you to just to see those who are in favour of that being the nominating committee's report for 2008. Could I see a show of hands in favour? Thank you very much. Anyone against? No. Wonderful. Thank you. And it's great to see that so many people readily accepted their position this year. And um, the thing that we all, not only the officers, but all of us as members of the Wangarei Seventh-day Adventist Church, is to think out a mission statement for this church. Because without a mission statement, we're going nowhere. We're just going around in circles. So I'd like you all to think about that in the next month um, for when these officers come into, into their uh, departments, that we have a mission statement to blaze out to here in Wangarei. Is that okay? So from the small ones right up to the elders and members, think of a mission statement that we can present to this church. Because then it's easy for us to work together when we've got a common goal, not that we don't have a common goal. Okay? Thanks for that. Let's just pray, uh, bow as I ask the Holy Spirit to be with us now. Dearest Heavenly Father, we'd like to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we can be here this morning. And we just praise you for your word, Lord, because it is a light unto our feet. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to each and every one of us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's a wonderful day, all right. And I'd just like to use this wonderful day to take you back roughly 4,000 years ago. And it was a lovely day too in northern Israel. All, all the villages throughout the northern part of Israel were experiencing this wonderful warm day. And I don't know how many of you have been to Israel or that part of the Middle East, but it's dry and it's pretty barren. So the heat that was being presented on this particular day was absolutely amazing. It was relatively early in the morning, the, the desert cold had gone, the sun was out and everybody was just out enjoying the day. The birds were singing, the animals were grazing up on the fields uh, where the shepherds had guided them and even the crops, the wheat, were swaying gently in the early morning breeze. It's a great day, the kids are out playing in the streets, neighbours are chatting, water pots are being emptied and placed back in behind the kitchen where they belong. The mothers are out chatting and talking to the neighbours. The men are, like usual, at work. And, uh, but there seems to be an uneasiness around. Even though it's a beautiful day, the mothers keep glancing to see where their children are, what they're up to. There just happens to be this uncanny feeling in the air. But some of the mothers just shrug it off as being, um, being them themselves, that they've been a bit overprotective, maybe. So they continue exchanging pleasantries and one or two are even invited in by the neighbours for early morning refreshments. However, there is one mum who is constantly at the window watching her children at play and in a fear disturbs her. And for the sake of a name, we'll call this woman Rebecca. That sounds a good name for an Israeli woman, doesn't it? So Rebecca stand, steals, in the last moment, a quick glance at the window, out the window, just to see where her two children are. They are pretty close to the front garden, and being reassured where they are, 
she heads out the back to get in the re already dried clothing. It's beautiful, the washing, it's dry, and it smells really fresh from that new goat's milk that she just bought at the market a couple of weeks ago. And uh, as she's starting to take the clothes off the line and put them in the basket, her fear becomes actual. The sound, that horrible sound of horses' hooves come charging into the village. Her inner fear is confirmed. The thundering of horses' hooves as they near the village is like thundering. She clambers quickly over the basket of clothing and races around the outside of the house. That was the quickest way for her to get in front of the house. As the street comes into view and the dust of the horses raises upwards to the sky, she gasps, gasps in horror to see only her son standing with his playmate, looking dazed as the horsemen, at the horsemen as they already speed out of the village. And, in the, and again, for the, na for the sake sorry, of a name, she screams at her son and says, Where is Madeline, your sister? The young boy, crying and stammering, utters those dreadful words that no mother wants to hear. They grabbed her, he says, taking her son and his playmate into her arms, sobbing. Rebecca comforts the two children and is able to still praise God for sparing them. From that day on, the life of Rebecca and her daughter Madeleine would never be the same. Their tomorrow would never be the same. Those wretched Syrians again have kidnapped our children. Every now and then a company of Syrian soldiers would ride into town and cart off any young girl they saw. This time it was our so-called Madeleine. Let's take up the story from the Bible as we go to um, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. And naturally I've been paraphrasing some of this story. So we turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, take up our story um, in verse 1. And it says here, For Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honourable because by him the Lord had been given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valour, but he was a leper. Naaman was a great man, honourable, and because of him the Lord had given deliverance unto the Syrians. He was a mighty man of valour, but the only problem was he was a leper. And isn't that amazing to think? Here we have a leper serving the Syrian army. If it wasn't Israel, he would have been an outcast. We don't know what degree of leprosy that, that Naaman had. But it doesn't matter because he was worthy to still serve his master. In verse 2 it goes on to say, and this is where we catch up to our story, and it says, And the Syrians had gone out, gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So here we catch up with our story about Madeleine, um, uh, who'd been taken away by this company of Syrian soldiers and brought in to serve as, uh, as a maid or a waitress on Naaman's wife. And isn't it amazing to think that Madeline, our little maid, her whole um, life had changed in an instant. And we know, some of us too, that when we're in a foreign country, it can be that the language is, has changed and it's even more difficult to understand what is going on. Um, so here we have this little maid who must have been confused and, and, and upset, disappointed, had been taken away from her family. In verse 3 it goes on to say, And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. So here we have Madeline, our little maid, not thinking of herself, but thinking of her, master, uh, her, her mistress's wife, her husband, Naaman, right? If he was only in Samaria, the prophet there could heal him. 
when God is with the prophet, he could heal Naaman from his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid, that is of the land of Israel. So one had heard her speaking to uh, her mistress and went and portrayed it to the king of Israel, uh, of Syria, sorry, in verse 5. And it says, And the king of Syria said, Go, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. Now someone got this story a bit wrong, didn't they? Whoever heard the, what, uh, what Madeleine said said it was the prophet that he is to go to, not to, to the king, right? But anyway, the king says, okay, and it may be, the, may be the culture of those days that the king's only associated with the kings of the other country. We could go down now into verse 6, and it says, And he brought the letter to the king of Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Saying, Now when this letter has come unto thee, behold, I have herewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that they may recover him of his leprosy. Here, even now, we also see how great um, Naaman was held in the sight of his master, the king of Syria. So he sends his letter down to the king of Israel, saying um, that when you receive this, I want you to heal Naaman from his leprosy. But it wasn't possible for the king of Israel to do it, was he? Was it? Well, maybe it would have been if he had a relationship with God. But it was, Na it was the prophet of Samaria that would be the only one that could heal Naaman. And then we go down onto verse 7 and it says, And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man descend unto me to recover a man of leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh to quarrel against me. So the king of Israel got the wrong end of the stick, didn't he? He knew that it wasn't possible for him to, to heal uh, Naaman from his leprosy. And he said, oh no, the king of Syria just wants to pick an argument with me. But it wasn't the case, was it? Then uh, in verse 8 it goes down to say, And it was so that Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes. Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So when Elijah had heard that the king had rent his clothes um, in pure frustration, he simply says, why, why do you rent your clothing? Send him to me. I'll show you that there is a prophet in Israel. I will glorify God in this instant. So Naaman is then sent down to see Elijah. And we pick that up in, um, in verse um, 8. And it was so when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had sent his clothes and he had rent his clothes, that... The, he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know there is a prophet in Israel. Verse 9, So Naaman came with his horse and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. And verse 10 goes on to say, And Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again unto thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now, a pretty simple task, isn't it? To go down and wash in the Jordan. But it says in verse 11, But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. So here we can see that the background of Naaman, he was used, of, used to ceremony and, and maybe, um, you know, uh, parties and stuff and he expected a big showing here but he was amazed that Elijah sent his messenger to him to pass this message on to him. Naaman of course couldn't discern what uh, Elijah was saying to him. He wasn't, uh, didn't have that relationship with God. And then Naaman goes on to say in verse 12 and he says, Are not Abana and Papha rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And I was thinking as I was reading that, how many times have we done things like that when they don't go our way? 
we think we know it better and try and do it our way instead of listening to what the word of the Lord says. Verse 13, and it says, And his servants came near and spoke unto him and said, My father, he says, If the prophet had bid thee to do something great, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he says to thee, Wash and be clean? Right? Here we have it again, a confirmation that if it was something to be manifested where, where Naaman could show, show himself to the public, he would have done it. But because it was just a simple task of going and washing and, uh, and becoming clean, no, he thought that wasn't enough. And sometimes we think too what we're doing is not enough in trying to make it our own way. So then in verse 14 it goes on to say, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. If he'd only just done that in the first place, he, uh, he would have been right. And it says, And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a child, and he was clean. And it says down there in verse 15, um, before I go down to the next verse, by doing what he did, he actually went through a born-again experience and became as a child of God, new and clean. It's that simple, isn't it? Verse 15, And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. So here we have Naaman realising and accepting the fact that there is only one God, and that is the God of the, of the Israelites. But then he tried to turn around and pay for his healing. And we're thankful that the, the man of God, Elijah, says down in, uh, in verse 16, 16, and he says, But he said, As the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. The plan of salvation, the gift of eternal life, we can't buy it, can we? It's for free. It's a gift. And here we have a, a, sim a similarity here where Naaman tried to buy his healing, but he'd been healed and he went away praising God. The gift of God is for free. We cannot purchase eternal life. It is a free gift and no matter how many riches we lay up on this earth, none of it, none of it is going to purchase us eternal life. The reason for that is because it's been done. And we, see, we saw that in our Sabbath school this morning. Jesus paid a terrible price for us to have eternal life, for us to be free from sin. He paid it all on Calvary, the debt of sin that has been paid. Naaman's life was now changed through the act of obedience and humility. God used a little maiden and changed Naaman's tomorrows. In the face of fear, anguish and loss, Madeleine, our little maid, her tomorrows were changed in the flash, flash of a moment as she lived out her life now in Syria. Rebecca, her mother, her tomorrows were changed because she could no longer share the joys of her daughter, Madeleine, as she lived out the rest of her years. Tomorrows aren't promised, well, not on this earth anyway. Our expectation of our tomorrows can change today, in a moment, this afternoon. If Jesus is not the Lord of your life at this moment, then change your tomorrows now. If you don't do it now, then your tomorrow will be a repeat of the past, a repeat of last week, a repeat of yesterday. Same old, same old. Yes, you see, it's not about us, is it? Is it really about us? No. We think it is all about us, just like Naaman, the great Syrian soldier. I want an audience with the man of God. I want, we want. No, it is not about what we want. It is all about what Jesus wants, what Jesus requires of us. As I mentioned earlier, it has been done. That price has been paid. Jesus even said, it is finished. This price that he paid 
was something that we just cannot understand. However, the gift is still there for the offering, but for how much longer, we don't know. Jesus said today, today is this moment. Today is your time to make history for yourself. Today is the day of salvation. If we do not make a stand for Jesus today, then tomorrow is not worth living. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, Hebrews 3.15. It is, it is not about us. It's all about Jesus, about what Jesus has done for us. But you might say, well, it is about me, isn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm too tired to come to church on the Lord's Sabbath as Jesus' habit was to go to the synagogue. That person looked at me strange and said something, I think, about me. Um, and, and, I got, and I got this thing to plan. I, I, can't, I can't follow Jesus. Most of the time when it's about me, it's when I'm turning away from God and maybe dabbling in the sin that I like to dabble in, whether it be a, a wrong relationship or deceiving the person or, or, or joking about the name of God. No, it's not about us. Jesus has put everything in place for us. Again, when he paid the ultimate price, he said it is finished. From the point of the resurrection morning, it was all about glory and praise for Jesus. And so it is still until today. Constantly his praise and glory should be on our lips and in our minds and hearts for what he has done for each and every one of us here today. But not only for us, for our families and friends that's our personal mission, isn't it? To take it to our family and friends and our neighbours and our workmates so that they too will have their tomorrows changed. Jesus had, has filled his word and the Bible with ten thousands of, prom or thousands, sorry, of promises and they are all in there for every daily need that we have. He has planned it all out for us and that is why it is not about us now it is about him, Jesus, our Lord Jesus, my Saviour, Jesus, your Saviour. He has given us the Holy Spirit as a comforter. Yes, we are all thankful. Praise the Lord. You see, it's about him. Promises galore so that we all have what we need and are protected and directed. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He can spiritually feed us. He said, if you're thirsty, I am the water of life. Come to me and I will quench your thirst. I have, a, I have a water that is much better than the physical water. He said, I am the light of the world. I'll show you the way. Don't walk in darkness. Come unto me and I will give you rest. Hebrews 4.1 So we don't have to be burdened. All we have to do is come to him and he will give us rest. Just come and see he also says that the truth will set us free. It has set me free because I know what he's got planned for me. I know the boundaries where I can work in, the boundaries of the Ten Commandments. Today and daily, his promises are for us when we walk in his light. Over the years, some brothers and sisters, you may have heard them even say, I know the day that I gave my life. I know the date, the time when I gave my life to Jesus but they don't know the date and the time when they took it back. To follow Jesus is a lifetime ambition. It's a lifetime walk. The closer we come to Jesus, the closer we see that we need him. It's not about us, it's about him. We should have a thankfulness in our hearts for what he's done. When you give your life to Jesus, it is for life. We are to put on the armour and fight the good fight. Not alone, no. He says, I am with you till the very end. Isn't that something to praise the Lord for? Obedience. This is a beautiful um, thing I read this week. Obedience is the pathway to God's blessing and the highest expression of our worship of him. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth. The scripture also says that we are to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all our heart, 100%, not 20% or 
We've given our life to him. He's died for us. We owe it to him. I know we can't do anything to earn eternal life, but by glorifying and being thankful is what he deserves. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. After, it, after all, it is all good news. Let's not think it's about us. Pray without ceasing to the one who gave you life and who gives you eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Could we have our musicians back up, please, and we'll close our service today with singing hymn number 625.